we need to have periods of the day where we are unstimulated by the external world. And it's called boredom. But boredom is really just coming back home and, you know, being agitated and not yet settled. But if you look at any child and you remember from your childhood how we used to hanker, you know, to our parents, I'm bored and bored and bored. And they literally used to probably tell us things like, well, what do you want me to do, you know? Go out and play or, you know, go and play with the rocks, right? There was just no question of them being bothered because they were busy and there were no apps. There was nothing really. And guess what happened to us? After restless boredom came engrossed creativity and deep connection to nature, to ourselves, to songwriting. We wrote poetry, we read, we played with birds and stones. We found something inestimable through that journey. But now we're bypassing these moments and we're never bored anymore. I mean, boredom has gone out of fashion, which is the greatest tragedy. Dr. Shefali, I can't tell you what an honor it is to have you on the show. I've been following your work for a very long time. In fact, quick story. The first time I was exposed to your book were The Conscious Parent, which by the way, I actually have here. Where is it? All right? So wow, you have it. it. We do, we do. Um, was I was in Jamaica um, with my wife and she was pregnant at the time with our first and she was sitting there and she was reading the book and I looked over and I said, what's that? She's like, oh, you should read it. And I was like, no, 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 no. I know all this stuff. You know, this is what I teach in, in leadership. And, you know, she left and I sort of, the book was sitting there and I reached over and I grabbed it and then I, I powered through the book. And I tell a lot of people, cause I recommend your book a lot. Um, it was probably one of the best books I've read, uh, specifically as a parent and coming into being a new parent. So for me, your work has been, has been profound and, and very helpful in my own parenting. And today we're going to talk about your latest parenting book, which is very exciting, uh, which is called the parenting map, right? Yes, it's the parenting map. I'm holding it up in case you watch it on video. It is step-by-step -step solutions to consciously create the ultimate parent-child relationship. I wrote this book as a how-to. You know, the book you're referring to is called The Conscious Parent. That is my seminal breakthrough work in the field of conscious parenting before conscious parenting was even a thing. That was the first book that really began to talk about this in a new way. But And then I've written other books, but this book is the how-to. So I've really broken it down. It's for the lay parent out there, parent of any age group kid who wants to elevate themselves. Conscious parenting basically is a, is a revolutionarily different model from the way you and I were raised, which I call the traditional parenting model, which was basically controlling, fear-based, guilt-shaming, punishing. And this model is something so new that parents often think that it's you know not a, they don't even understand it it's such a breakthrough but it's about the parenting parenting the parent parenting themselves because yeah. as you know in your work that's what stops us the most our own lack of inner parenting and our own inner child mm -hmm. and that's what comes out in our parenting dynamic and messes up the relationship so this yeah. book is the parenting map if anyone out there is struggling wants to be a better parent then they should grab a copy of this book a thousand percent and you know i think what's so profound about the work that you're doing which is really turning that lens back to oneself which it's you know why, why why does this start to happen and you know i love the fact that at an unconscious level what we start to do is we have this need to protect our kids and ensure they're successful and if we're not careful we're projecting our own needs and ways on what that's going to look like um and with this new book which is very exciting which is the map so is that what brought up this book which was we've got a lot of content out there and the joke about parenting today is once upon a time when we grew up there were no parenting books right there wasn't a manual on how to deal with your kids and i say to a lot of people today the exciting times that we're living in is there are these books there are these manuals there are guidance and learning and coaching for us to do so so what drove this this book versus the others well, you know, I'm a clinical psychologist, so I work with the pain of dysfunctional childhoods all the time. And I really believe that if the parent gets that dynamic kind of right, you don't have to be perfect, but if you get that relationship right, the relationship, the connection, then you are really setting your kid up for success. Not whether you send them to the best Ivy League school or the best vacations or expose them to the best science camp. 
that's not going to do this. The, the thing that is pivotal in all our lives is a relationship where you feel seen, where you feel worthy, where you feel honored for your sovereign spirit, which is independent of others' opinions or validation. That is what I teach parents to give their children because that is something only a parent can really give and break. And once the kid has it, they will they will forage the earth much less for this external validation, which in turn then creates self-worth and resilience. So I focus on how to build this bond and there are techniques to follow. There are things to do and there are things to not do. And uh, so I lay it all out in this book. And once that bond is forged, then that kid is really you know, strong in who it is they are. So I wrote it because I see the devastating impacts of that lack of bond. And I see how adults struggle because of that lack of connection. So I want to help as many parents out there to raise generations of children who kind of feel connected versus feel like they're floundering in the dark and not knowing where to land. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, what you're, what I hear you talk about is the, our need to have significance, right. To be seen and to, to be heard. And it's very natural in a lot of cases for us to dismiss kids. Uh, I, I find myself doing it with my kids. We were driving home yesterday and, you know, my son was acting up and there was just this unconscious, like, all right, you're going to stop behaving that way and blah, 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 blah. And I had this moment where I was like, this is more for me versus, versus the parenting. And my wife is excellent at this, by the way. She's like, I need you to calm down. Let me handle this. And I listened to the way she speaks and, and, and how she handled the situation. And it was very encouraging and dialogue and, you know, helping the kid express. So, you know, um, and I also, she's a big fan of yours. So let me ask you this. So in this book, you talk a lot about the three stages that we need to go through and the steps underneath. Why don't we sort of begin well, actually, before we even go there, why do you think parents have such a difficult time seeing that maybe this is them versus their kid? The reason we parents have a hard time is not be just because we're hot-headed, but we are almost given the permission to be deluded and feel like we are the ultimate authority. We are told that these children are ours because they come from us. We're told that parents know best. And because we were never heard as children, we think that that's just the way to, it's unilateral, it's it's unmitigated, it's relentless power. We're given that impression. So we walk into this journey thinking we will have absolute control. And if we don't, there's something wrong with the kid. And therefore, we have then have the right to control them even more and punish them because we have to be in control, right? This, the commandment, obey thy mother and father, it starts from there. This parents are the ultimate authority, but with that comes this unmitigated, uh, blind, delusional kind of domination. And we don't see that. We don't see that it comes with this desire for control versus just having to be in charge, we also want to be in control. And that's inevitably a failure. It's, it's never going to be. We can never really control anything outside of our mind, and we can barely control our mind. So we're given, we bequeath this inheritance of traditions past that parents are the ultimate. And with that comes this hot-headedness, this arrogance, this ignorance, that there's nothing to learn from our children. There's no possible way they know anything. We are right. We are correct. We are superior. We are perfect. We get to do what we want. If we have a tradition, we have a right to pass it on. And then they are bad if they don't follow it. If we have a religion, we are right to pass it on. And then they are bad if they don't follow it. So it's basically our way or the highway. And we were we were raised to believe that and our, our parents raised us that way. I grew up a very, a very controlling dominant father. Um, I swore I wasn't going to turn into him. And guess what, end up turning into him. And, and I, I'm aware of it. But like, you know, I as you were talking about this need for control, that's where I get caught. I get caught in like, I, you know, it's not about the kid being quiet or, or changing their behavior. It's about me controlling the situation. And, you know, on a good day, I catch myself on a bad day. Sometimes I need to be reminded of that. So in this book, you talk a lot about the steps. And I think what's very interesting is, as you said, like you've got a map for people now, right? Like for the parents out there, there's a how-to. It's not just a thought. It's, it's not just like this grand sort of, you know, way of thinking, but it's actually step by step. And one of the pieces you talk about in the stages is, is to not punish. And we'll circle back to that. But can we can we start with that, which is what what is the the negative or the negative impact in in taking this approach of punishment 
Oh my goodness, punishment. You want to start right at the at the core of all toxicity. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Again, it's this arrogance and ignorance that when we when we get to arbitrarily decide how to, you know, treat our children, scold our children, degrade our children, punish our children based on what we think is misbehavior, um, it, it just leads to so much disconnection. You know, punishment is it ranges from all the way from verbal abuse, name calling, labeling, degrading, shaming, guilting. Uh, fear mongering, taking away things, throwing away things, uh, you know, grounding, locking kids up, and then all the way to spanking, bullying, you know, slapping our kids, yelling, screaming. Um, so we think that because we have control, we need to have control in a tyrannical, dogmatic, superior way. And then when the kid misbehaves, we unleash that superiority and that dogmatism, and we crack the whip, whatever it is. And we think we're right. And we think we're allowed because we are unsupervised. Can you believe we're unsupervised? I mean, there's so many of us who are so <laughs> mentally disturbed and we have no supervision, no training, no license, no guidelines, no coaching. And we're out there thinking that we are so right and we're so wrong. I was so wrong when I woke up. I realized I was so wrong. I was messing it all up. So punishment only creates temporary you know true power it only creates temporary suppression only temporary right behavior it will not be sustainable and it no, not only will not be sustainable it will backlash in such a profound emotional way our children will break apart will fall apart will fall to pieces and they will resent you and they will walk into the world resentful bitter angry, chip on the shoulder, and then do it to their kids. Like you were raised with a controlling father, whether you like it or not, it comes out of your subconscious. And right. it's just your default pattern, even though you don't mean it. So punishment is toxic and there's no need to punishment. Punishment is actually loss of control. Mm. And the, what I teach is connection. And connection is the ultimate control, but people don't realize because it's a different kind of control. It's not about control over or power over. It's really an, a win-win situation where you and the child are working together to be both most powerful beings, not one over the other. Uh, it's a whole new model. And if you're raised in a hierarchical way from childhood, you will not understand this immediately. So that's why I beg people to try to be brave. Uh, I know it's out of their comfort zone, but that's why I've laid it out in such simple steps because I know it's intimidating for someone who grew up with power, who thinks that that mm -hmm. is their right. Right. You know, you just nailed something, which is the one thing we're not supervised or led or governed by uh, in is parenting. In all other aspects, we are. We go to the office and we have a leader or a supervisor or a manager. We get we drive a car on the road. We have traffic signals and lights telling us when to slow down and stop and go. We there's 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 a, a regulator for us. But when it comes down to parenting, that's the one environment that we don't have governance and supervision on. And in some cases, I think you just nailed that. Maybe we should. Maybe there should be some sort of like, you know, supervisor for parents. And if not, we could pick up the book. So let's go through. You You lay out 20, 20 uh, steps within three stages of the parenting map. Why don't we start with that? What are the stages that we go through here? So I laid it out like a true self uh, growth journey. Uh, like I would take my clients. So you're literally doing therapy with me page after page. It's my voice. I kept it in the voice I talk. So I made it very colloquial and conversational. So three stages. Stage one is from frustration to clarity. And stage two is breaking down patterns. Stage, stage three is how do I connect with my kid? So stage one has six steps. I'm going to quickly just run through them. Uh, the first one is called focus on the right problem. The problem is you, you, the parent, right? Not to give you blame, but to tell you that the solution lies with you. Uh, it's not the child. The more you're trying to raise the perfect child, the more you will mess it up. Mm -hmm. So I talk about that. Step two is about destroying the fantasy and how we enter the parenting process with this movie in our head. And, you know, these kids, when they dare to be their own 
you know, stars and the, the star in their own movie, we, we get upset uh, mm-hmm. because they're not following our script. They're burning the set. They're disobeying the director. And we are like losing money and losing time. And we're very upset. So I talk about that fantasy and how we all have the perfect movie in our head and it doesn't work out. And then we get upset and we think something is wrong with us. Um, And then step three is called relinquished control. And that is all about letting go of this notion that in order to raise a kid, you need to have control. I promise you, you don't need to have control. What you need to have is connection. Connection gives you the greatest influence. It's like you and me, right? We want to hang around with people who we feel connected to, not those who control us. We want to be with people who see our beauty, our value, who honor who it is we are, where we don't have to pretend, uh, where we feel safe. So that's what I talk about here. Uh, Step four is one of the most important steps. It's called end the chase for happiness and success, because most of us are trying to raise happy and successful children. And in doing that, we screw it all up because You know, every time our kid has big emotions or is going through a genuinely difficult life experience, we lose our shit because we feel so bad when they are feeling unhappy because we've measured our worth on their smile, on their gratitude, on their relentless joy. That is such a one-sided myopic view. Children can have a multitude of experiences and they should, and that should not define our worth. And then same with success. We've so narrowly defined success that when our kids don't fit into the box, we think we get an F grade. Mm -hmm. Uh, Step five is called dump the savior complex where, you know, we have this misguided notion that we are, you know, God and we can micromanage their moods, tell them how to think about things, give them opinions. Literally, we are raising a mini me who we're here to rescue. So we couldn't rescue ourselves. We couldn't meet our own dreams. So now we're going to make our children fulfill those fantasies. And step six is discard the labels. I talk about the the real dysfunctionality of labels, the pernicious nature of labels and how dangerous it is to have labels. And then stage two has another uh, few steps of uh, breaking down your ego, understanding what your ego is. I define the different kinds of ego patterns here so parents can identify their ego style. And then stage three is learning your kid's psychology, reframing mistakes, understanding what to do instead of punishment and learning kid language. You know, we don't understand uh, our children's way of communicating. And we come from this adult parent mode, but that is so divergent from how children speak uh, that we have to learn a whole new language. So I, I teach all this in the book. So it's like taking a mini psychology course and going for therapy. As I was listening to you talk about stage one, there's, uh, I'm sure you know, there's a, a debriefing model when someone's gone through trauma and you debrief them in the stages that they go through. And what we begin to do is we mess it up in the way we listen to them, right? So as people start to talk to us and they're telling us their story, we launch in and we minimize. And I see we, we do this with kids a lot, right? Which is, it's okay. It's just a game. Don't worry about it. You know, we'll judge and criticize them, which is they should have done it this way or that way and, 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 and problem solve. Not only we do this with our kids, we do it with our relationships we do it in life and stuff so you know i really like the fact that you talk about stage one really focuses back on us and it's the therapy that we need to go through and uncover that you mentioned labels what do you mean by labels is that like me saying you're a bad kid or or you know you you need to be more like you know uh, sarah is that is that what you talk about when it comes down to labels Yeah, I think even if we don't speak it, we think it, right? Why is my kid like this? Why can't my kid be more extroverted? Why can't my my kid be uh, more polite, more nice, more kind, more gregarious, more this, more that, more uh, an athlete, more talented? Oh, my goodness. If we're honest about the constant Rolodex of labels that we're spinning through, constantly judging our kids, right? Judgment can even be positive. Oh, that's so nice. Oh, you're so sweet. Oh, you're so loving. Oh my goodness. Can we be quiet? Can we just observe, right? So in meditation, we practice the art of observation and witnessing for its total power. Like we're not witnessing to get to another place. We're just witnessing because that state of observation creates appreciation, creates gratitude, creates flow, where you're not tampering with anything. You know, it's like walking past the most beautiful rose or flower and not touching it, not tampering with it, not plucking it, just observing the beauty 
and allowing it to be in its sovereign state. So similarly with our kids, let them be in their state. Stop over interfering and managing and micro needling and micro interfering. And we're constantly, you know, buffing and polishing and giving our opinion. Oh my goodness. It's, it's well, what it's doing really is it's diminishing our children's light because mm. we are constantly telling them subconsciously that who it is they are is not good enough. And they and like we're tweaking it, you know, uh, it's like we watch a sunset and we complain to, you know, nature, you know, today you're a bit too orange. I, I like purple more, you know, no, we don't do that. We just observe the sunset, appreciate what it's given us and honor it. And that is like the basic 101 of parenting that we literally bypass. Right. And and for different ages and kids, like I got a six and an eight year old versus like teenagers. How does this change versus you just remain consistent with the process? Oh, the process uh, changes in that we keep moving from center stage to backstage. Right. So mm -hmm. in the beginning, we have to be more hands on. We have to take them to school. We have to change their diapers. Right. We have to maybe do their homework with them. But our goal is always to relinquish control. Our goal is to increase influence and connection, relinquish control. So this is what we're inching toward. As we grow older with them, we are uh, creating this deep reverence for their autonomy so that they have reverence and reliance on their autonomy. So we are teaching them to look inside themselves, to ask their own opinion, to validate themselves, to figure out their own life more and more and more. We're always trying to release the control. And by doing that, we teach them the practice to make mistakes, to get up after the fall, to see that they're re resilient, it's not the end of the world, but they won't be able to do that if we're hovering all over them and over parenting. So conscious parenting is not over parenting, but it's also not under parenting, it's just conscious parenting, meaning we, we attune to who it is our children are and then titrate our approach according to that. Yeah. You know, you've talked about resilience. And if you look at the younger generations today, there, there's a conversation or a question around resilience, right? Um, and the whole joke of, you know, helicopter parenting, and then what was called snowplow parenting, which was re remove obstacles out the way. Um, do you see that in kids today or the younger generation? Is it, are, are we seeing the younger generation less resilient because of maybe our over parenting over the last couple generations? Yes. So I'm glad you said that. So yes, if I see less resilience, it's because of our overparenting. It's our generation that produced all these apps that now our children have become addicted to, and they now don't leave the couch and everything comes to their doorstep, so to speak. And then we're upset with them because they have no resilience. Well, because we've taken out the hardship, right? We've taken out the process and we've just gone to outcome. Everything is outcome. We get the outcome like this. There's no delayed gratification. There's no waiting. There's everything is titrated. You can pick and choose on the app exactly what you want. And everything is being tailored to their ego, right? When I talk about conscious parenting, I, I talk about attuning to the kid's essence, not their ego, but the world that we've created for our children is all about their ego. I want, I need, and it's all about me, 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 me. And look at all these selfies and filters. It's all about propagating the grandiosity of the self. And then our children are fragile now because they don't know how to wait. They don't know how to live imperfectly. All the apps are all about perfection. So every time they encounter imperfection in self or other, they cancel the whole situation. And yeah. that intolerance is really the root of evil because we are, we are teaching intolerance of imperfection, whereas imperfection is the fabric of life. Yeah. Yeah, totally agree. You know, I moved to Costa Rica close to two years ago, and a few people asked me why. Uh, in Canada, it was pretty rough during the pandemic, and that was the beginning of why we left. But I saw my kids down here, and I saw my kids grow up slow, slower. I saw them get back to some of the basics, which is no apps, and they, they have their iPads, don't get me wrong. But they get to have this this life of of experience and social and connection and 
falling down and hurting themselves. And I'll never forget the first beach we went to had all these little hermit crabs over. And my daughter was panicked. She was, she didn't want to put her feet on the ground. Anyway, you see her today. She's like, uh, she's like swinging through the jungle, right? And someone said to me the other day, how the kids doing? I'm like, you know, what's really great about living down here is kids grow up a little slower uh, Mm -hmm. without the intensity of programs and sign them up for this. And, you know, I think about some friends back in North America with their kids, which they are so, I would define over-programmed. Like the, the, they have, the parents have decided that my child will play piano. they will be a dancer. They'll go to this, they'll play hockey, they'll play baseball. It just doesn't stop. And, you know, you, you, you always wonder, which is like, have you ever asked the kid whether they want to do this? And the quick answer is no, right? Well, even if the kid says yes, I can guarantee you no kid wants to do anything except that really very rare 1% kid. Most kids just want, most kids just want to have fun. And that doesn't mean you're raising a slacker. That is the nature of childhood. Childhood is the time to play to have creativity, imagination, restless boredom, uh, spontaneous spontaneity, and a lot of fun. And we are, you know, creating these little mini adults too early who then burn out because they did not get that time to simply explore their imaginations, their friends, nature. And uh, we're putting them into so many supervised activities, one after the other, that no child really wants that. Maybe that rare one percent, as I said, but not more than that. Most kids just, if they enjoy playing tennis, they want to play tennis without it becoming a career. If they want to swim, they just want to swim and splash around and have fun without it becoming a profession. They just want to have hobbies, but there's no such thing as a hobby anymore. Now it's like a business investment. Mm-hmm. True, true. You mentioned restless boredom, which I think is an awesome, awesome concept. Can you expand upon that? Well, you know, we we need to have periods of the day where we are unstimulated by the external world. And it's called boredom. But boredom is really just coming back home and, you know, being agitated and not yet settled. But if you look at any child, and you remember from your childhood, how we used to hanker, you know, to our parents, I'm bored and bored and bored. And they literally used to probably tell us things like, well, what do you want me to do? You know, go out and play, or, you know, go and play with the rocks, right? There was just no question of them being bothered because they were busy and there were no apps. There was nothing really. Um, And guess what happened to us? After restless boredom came engrossed, creativity and deep connection to nature, to ourselves, to songwriting. We wrote poetry, we read, we played with birds and stones. We found something inestimable through that journey. But now we're bypassing these moments and we're never bored anymore. I mean, boredom has gone out of fashion, which is the greatest tragedy because our children are through boredom, you can get connected to your own resourcefulness. But right. through this lack of boredom, you're constantly being fed other people's resourcefulness. So they're feeding your mind instead of you feeding your mind. And that great bypass is such a great disconnection to self. Yeah. My kid said the other day, I'm bored. I'm like, perfect. I'm like, yeah. enjoy. All right. Go figure it out. <laughs> go yes, do you. Exactly. All right, let's let's go to stage two. So stage one is all about me and really sort of, you know, adjusting that and recognizing that, uh, you know, there's a there's an exercise that I have to go through in order to be a successful parent. What is stage two all about? Stage two is understanding that you are in a pattern and you've been in a pattern forever. And this pattern shows up in most of your relationships And you can break the pattern, but you have to first become aware of the pattern. So if you're ruled through anger, I call that a fighter parent. If you're ruled through anxiety, I call that a fixer parent. If you're ruled through attention seeking, I call it the feigner, you know, like the one who feigns that parent. If you are ruled through avoidance, uh, I call it the freezer parent. And if you're ruled through abandonment, you are the fleer parent. So you're going to be a combination of different things, but most people have one predominant default pattern and I have subtypes. And so recognizing when this shows up, when you're ruled by an emotion is really valuable because then you begin to see it show up over and over again. And then it creates a dysfunctionality between you and your children that now 
you have an opportunity to combust and disrupt. So that's the power of this whole section. It's really doing therapy with me and uh, great insights in this section, deep inner work. And then you come out on the other end with a greater clarity of who you are, but also how you want to be with your kids. So back to it's all about you and not the kids. Yes. Yeah. Oh, this, this section is the most valuable section in the book because you will get so much insight, not only to yourself and your partner, but also to how you were raised in childhood. Right. I'm a fighter parent, by the way. So when I met with stress or emotion, the emotion I know, and you, you know, if we use my language, ego states, we call it the angry child, right? Yeah. And, uh, or the reactive child. And it's the only way I know how to respond to the triggers. Yeah. So part of what you talk about in this next stage is triggers. Can you, can you expand a little bit upon what is a trigger? What's facing your trigger? Yeah. We typically think of a trigger as something on the outside, but I reframe that to saying that the trigger is never on the outside. The real trigger is on the inside. The outside person, place, or thing is just the flame. But that flame can be put out if you are calm waters inside yourself, or the flame could explode into the biggest bomb explosion if you are filled with gasoline inside. So it depends on what's inside. The outside event is just a flame. It could go out or it could become huge, an inferno. So um, it's not ever just the flame. It's how it interacts with your inner terrain that creates the potential for the dysfunction or the function. So, you know, we, we typically, when a child uh, acts out, we blame the child, but it's really how the child's acting out triggers us on the inside, that is really the problem, right? That is where the rubber meets the road. But we're not willing to look at that inner work. We just want to fix the child, blame the child, and just act as if it's all about the child, as if we are not co-creators. So right. this section is all about how we are co-creators in our reality and our experiences. Yeah, we do this in all our relationships, right? Business relationships, spousal, partner relationships, friends, family. It's never me. It's always someone else, right? It's like <laughs> they triggered me. And what you're saying is, no, the trigger was always inside of you. It was just the external match or flame that ignited it. And that's what you do with it. Is this what you're also sort of expanding upon in the next chapter, which is about dysfunctional loops and patterns? Yeah, so, then, so then now, you know, you put together your pattern, you put together all your triggers. Now you're just stuck and embedded in this constant, you know, the kid says, uh, I hate you. The parent says, uh, go to your room. You know, the kid gets a C grade. The parent says, go to your room. The, the kid uh, breaks something. The parent says, go to your room. I mean, it's just this robotic loop that we get fixed in. And we are not aware. We keep thinking, well, if I just do my part louder or more, more controlling, the kid will change their behavior. So the parent keeps yelling if you're a yellow parent or screamer parent. And the kid nothing changes. If anything, the kid keeps making the mistakes or keeps being a kid and they disconnect from you. So you have to, at some point, ask yourself, what is my goal here? Is my goal to create connection or disconnection? Because if it's disconnection, I'm doing a great job. Right. Can we undo this? I mean, how far do we go down this path before it's like, uh, uh, um, non-reversible, like we, 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 like the damage is done. I don't think it's ever irreversible, uh, you know, but if you're talking irreversible back to infancy, of course, we've lost the time now. But I don't think it's ever irreversible in terms of the potential for healing. Uh, we always have the potential for healing. Of course, both parties, as the kid grows older, both parties have to be on board. Uh, but regardless, the parent can heal enough so that they show up in a more beautiful way for the kids. So that is always a very uh, fluid po possibility and a, a le very less optimized possibility. I think we get so worried that it's too late uh, because of our own issues and we our own fear of rejection that we never try hard enough. But I can tell you, and you know this being a child, if your parents came to you today and said, you know what, I screwed up, I was effed up, I didn't know any better, please, you don't have to change, you don't have to talk to me, but just please hear me that I take accountability. Wouldn't that, it may not change the way you relate to them, but it'll change the way you feel about them. Yeah. Well, I'll share a personal story. My father said that to me on his deathbed. He like oh. very intense relationship. And it was in the last hour 
And he said to me, he said, look, I know I wasn't the best dad. I know I was aggressive and critical and controlling, and I didn't do it very well. And if there's anything you need to get off your chest right now, like now's the time to say it, like, cause I, I'm not going to be here tomorrow. So if you, if you're carrying any of this burden and this trauma, like, you know, you want to, you want to yell at me, you want to, you want to say something to me now's the time. And I, I had 32 years of stuff built up. And in that moment, it was let go all because of that. And of course he was passing and stuff, but I made that conscious decision to say, you know what, he did, he did what he did as dad and, and that's the best he could do. And I don't have to carry that trauma anymore. And yes, it, it changed the entire dynamic just in that moment. Oh, that's so powerful. I never, the first time I'm hearing somebody actually did that, you know, but I yeah. always tell parents to do that. You know, the minute you wake up, go and own it. Just take accountability. It's not about them loving you or, you know, saying you're the best parent or the worst parent or coming home to live with you. Maybe they'll still never want to see you again because it's not about them. It's about you waking up and taking accountability. And that's important. We need to do that because we need to own to our children. Hey, I really was not all put together. I hurt you. I'm sorry. It doesn't mean anything more than just you taking accountability. And that's the brave and honest thing to do. Yeah. And maybe we could do it more often and not when someone's, you know, in their last, last breath type of right. thing. Right. Right. All right. Talk to us about stage three. So stage three is really about the nuts and bolts of connecting, of getting uh, into the, the, the roots of our disconnection and how to connect, how to empathize, how to manage, um, you know, our children's moods, how to regulate ourselves, what are the keys to understanding our children's essence? Um, so this is where you bear the fruits of the first two parts of your journey. And now I teach you to practice how to be more connected, how to be more present. Mm -hmm. And this is what you talk about, learn kids psych, which is understanding their psychology. Yes, understanding your, your, your kids' essence and seeing their essence as a superpower. It's not here to be managed. It's here to flourish. Um, so when we understand our children and honor them for who it is they are, then they just open up and they blossom, them. And that connection gets really, uh, you know, really firm. And that's what this whole section is about in, in the book, The Parenting Map. And this is how it looks if you're watching on video. It's The Parenting Map. It's 20 steps as we've been talking about. And each step has homework and exercises to put on your fridge, your reminders, prompts, and very practical strategies to use with your kids. Amazing. How important is it, like, if 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 it is a, a coupled home, which there, there, there's two parents, how important is it for both parents to go through this book or go through this exercise together versus one of them doing it? Of course, we would love both to do it, but whoever is ready should just take the reins. Don't wait for your partner. Don't wait for anybody. Our children need at least one conscious parent, if not all, but at least one uh, is such a powerful force. It's better than zero, right? So, uh, you know, it is difficult when one does it and the other doesn't, but we owe it to our children that at least we show up in the most conscious way possible. One of the things you talk about is something called SIGNS, and it's, a, it's an acronym, S-I-G-N, uh, something inside's gone negative. Can you expand and, and explain that a little bit? I just give uh, parents this easy acronym to remember that when their kids are misbehaving, instead of pouncing on the behavior, try to remember that it's a sign for something deeper, uh, something inside gone negative, something inside your kid is bothering them. Maybe they're just hungry. Maybe they're just tired. Maybe somebody at school bullied them. Maybe the teacher said something. Maybe their clothes don't fit well enough, or maybe they're feeling embarrassed about something. You don't know. But you will be the place where they dump on because you're the safe space, hopefully. Uh, so instead of pouncing on the behavior, take the behavior as a, as a pointer to the real problem, which is something internal. Yeah. We just went through this with our six-year-old. Uh, his name is Rain. And uh, in his class, there's a lot of disruption. In fact, there was this big parent meeting and, and the school called and teachers and everyone met. And it turns out there's a small population, which is extremely disruptive. And part of the reason is the delay the delayed development that these kids have gone through over the last couple of years with the pandemic. Um not understanding social relationships and bad behavior and stuff. And my son was coming home and couldn't figure it out until we went to this meeting. And, and it became extremely clear that he, he's he been battling 
to concentrate and to focus and to 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 not be disrupted with this intense behavior and unless we had that meeting with them i i wouldn't have or we as parents probably wouldn't have realized that it was this this thing that he was going through there was he was really challenged with it and you know, upon learning that, I mean, obviously we've put some things in place and, and and addressed it, but I mean, this is exactly what you're talking about. You know, the science, which is something inside has gone, uh, um, gone right. uh, negative. Uh, negative. Yeah. And, and of course he at six can't articulate as well as an adult can. Right. So I would say thing you, and you ask stupid questions as parents, how school fight, fight. Right. And, and one of the things we've also learned is like it change up the questions a little bit like, hey, what what you what was great about today or, or, or get more specific and get more, more, more conversation happening. The other thing that you talk a lot about is um, um, reframing. And I, I'm a big fan of reframing. I talk about it in my coaching and in my training a lot, specifically with adults, because, you know, when you think about limiting beliefs and negative self-talk, it's it's a problem. Talk to us about uh, the three reasons kids misbehave and then how do we reframe that? Right. So kids misbehave really because of a lack of skill, which is their brain just hasn't developed enough. A uh, lack of experience. They haven't lived long enough. Lack of practice. And then the third one is lack of worth. So you as a parent have to be like the sleuth, this investigator to go, OK, I know my kid is a good kid. See, that's a given. My kid is a good kid. My kid is awesome. Now he's misbehaving or she's misbehaving because of one of these three reasons. And the minute you begin thinking of their misbehavior like this, you enter compassion, your heart melts, you open up and uh, you can begin to understand and help them at a deeper level versus just trying to manage the behavior because the behavior will keep showing up if you don't take care of the root. So uh, this is the frame I help parents with lack of skill, lack of experience, lack of worth. Yeah. Super, super, super effective and helpful. All right. Let me ask you this question. What do you think some of the greatest threats to consciously parenting our kids are? Um, social media, uh, <laughs> parents' own, uh, you know, narcissism, past wounds, their own lack of healing, you know, the, the triangulation that parents often do between parents and triangulate the kids. Um, Can you just explain what triangula uh, triangulating the kids or what that is? If you're having an issue with the with another, the other parent, you bring the kid in as the referee or as your therapist or as your ally, and then it's two against one, right? Or sometimes it's the two parents against the kid, right? And and so it's really these unhealthy alliances that get created. Um, so I think that's connected to the parents' unhealed stuff, but I would say social media and the parents' lack of growth and healing is are the two toxic elements I think right now uh, right. in our modern parenting. When you try to talk about triangulating, uh, triangulating, is that like you got the persecutor, the victim, and the rescuer in dynamic? Well, yeah, I like that, but it's it's just any time when you're trying to build alliances instead of keeping it open and fluid, you're trying to create armies and teams because you want to win. You look at it as a war, and you're trying to be competitive instead of letting it all flow and letting it all be unilateral and loving and safe for everybody. I'm surprised we've been successful raising kids generation after generation. I mean, considering the fact that like we, we, we we're pretty dysfunctional as human beings. But do you think we've been successful? I mean, it, it may not show up. It may have True. taken time, but look at the last 30 years where we've destroyed the earth and we've really, you know, destroyed each other. Do you think we've been successful? Right. I don't know. I, no, I, you just refer, you just you just nailed it. No, I don't think we've been successful. I think we've butchered it, and and we've got a lot of healing and 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 building and growing to do. And uh, it's going to start at home. Yes, yes, I agree. So grab a copy of my book, The Parenting Map, everyone, and and go through it. And uh, I would love for us all to be a part of this movement of raising our children so differently. Yeah. Well, we can now, and that's where we began, which is once upon a time, we could get away with the excuse, which is, I don't know, and there's no book out there. And today, wait a minute, you should know, and there's access to teachings and learnings and coaching and guidance and books and thought leadership. So in quotations for the audience, there's a there's a manual out there, right? And uh, you've written four of them, plus your fifth one, which is more personal about uh, themselves. All right. So we got, I got two more questions for you. Uh, the last question is the better human question, which we I'll come back to. Uh, but this is more personal, like you're, you're a parent. How hard is this for you to practice yourself? 
well, like any parent, it's it's all challenging, but I at least have this framework to come back to. And let me tell you, it's saved my life. It saved my relationship. It's it's just been so invaluable, this way of thinking. I, I have a way to think about my crap and, and heal my crap and get out of it. And I, I do it every day. I It's like a mantra. It's ingrained in me. It's the muscles that I operate with. So now it's my practice and I, I, it's a game changer. But not to say that it's still not challenging, but imagine being challenged and not having this manual, right? This way of thinking. This way of thinking is so liberating and so lovely. Uh, it's really made me a better human and a better parent and, and a better connector to other humans. It's amazing. Which brings us to the last question of the of the episode, which is what do you think we all need to do to be better humans tomorrow? I think we need to heal ourselves like right now. <laughs> and work on ourselves and grow and meditate totally agree and get your book and get my book yes <laughs> all right dr shivali you are amazing as mentioned i've been following your work for years um and and appreciate what you do and and the world needs more dr shivali's and thought leaders and coaches and teachers in fact the greatest thing we can do in this uh, in this uh, lifetime is teach and hopefully teach some good uh, lessons and tools for people to be better awesome thank you for being here the uh, parenting map when is it officially out and when can people buy it and uh, yeah, it's ready for order it? it's uh, it'll arrive in your in your at your doorstep in a few days so order it right away and uh, give it to your friends and give it to your parents <laughs> So it's called The Parenting Map. Awesome. To the audience, if you like today's episode, don't forget to like, don't forget to subscribe, don't forget to share. Dr. Shafali, we are going to post all of your links and everything. But to the audience, if you just Google Dr. Shafali, she's going to pop up everywhere. Go follow her on social. You're putting out amazing content and posts every day. And I know you also just ran a free summit for uh, parents when you brought, uh, uh, what, 30 other yes. coaches and psychologists like and therapists. Right. So they can still sign up. Uh, it's summit.drshafali.com. Amazing. We'll have that link there. Dr. Shafali, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. To the audience, we will see you at the next week's episode. We'll talk.